Let us pray. Almighty God, we bless your name for this workers retreat. We thank you for what we're learning. And we thank you for the prayers we're praying. And for the experiences you're all sharing us into. We thank you for what we have learned already. In the main messages. In the Bible studies. And in the seminars. And what we have even learned as we interact together. As we see one another. As we watch what other people do. As we sense your grace, your glory. In other people's lives. Father, we pray. That all these things you are revealing to us. Will make a definite unforgettable impact in every one of our lives in jesus name we pray lord you lead us into your word now enlighten us in your word that we will understand better than we understood before in jesus name we pray as i told you already i'm speaking on double cure for sin when we speak of cure, it means there has been a disease. When we talk of double cure, there must have been a twofold sickness. An example, you perhaps have heard of someone who has done or performed an operation. And then that place that had been cut open is now stitched you will need to understand that there is internal wound as well as external wound. And so you need a cure for the external wound and the internal wound also needs to be cured. It has sometimes happened to those who have gone through operations like that that there is external healing manifested so that as you look on the external part of the place where the operation was performed the external part is healed outwardly there is a cure and these patients will still be complaining that there is still pain inside which tells us is still expecting the cure on the inside and the cure will only be complete when there is a double cure when the external is taken care of and the internal part is also taken care of. Sin is twofold. One part external, outward. The other part internal, inbred sin. Its removal is also twofold. When you are forgiven your sins and you are pardoned, you are pardoned all the sins you have committed. That is dealing with the outward manifestations of sins but on the other hand when you go back to the cross the second time and you are purged and you have a second work of grace done in your heart then the internal inherited sin is dealt with first the outward second the inward double kill for sin you see man is a sinner in two ways number one by birth number two by choice and practice at birth man derives a sinful nature from adam referred to as the depravity or depraved nature instinctively man is inclined towards evil the reason is that's the way he was born in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Reading in verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Speaking about the same nature of sin. A sinner by birth. That when somebody is born, he inherits and carries into the world this nature of sin. Jesus expressed it this way in John chapter 3 and verse 6. 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That is, when you are born of the flesh, the natural birth makes you fleshly, makes you sinful, and makes the works of the flesh to be seen in your life. In Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I'm sure you can see very clearly that by birth man is a sinner. I said that there's a second way by which we declare man. And the Bible declares man to be a sinner. That is by choice and practice. That man makes decisions to sin. When it comes to the age of accountability, you see there is, when a child is born, although there is a sin principle in the heart of that child, a one-day-old child, two-days-old child, one-week-old child, even three-months-old child, still does not understand what he does. He might manifest temper, anger. He might even manifest some kind of wickedness as to even without having teeth, try to bite the mother to show his anger and to show that he's not pleased with the way the mother was delaying giving him the natural milk. And yet, even though the child does that, he has not come to the age of accountability. He cannot account for what he does. He doesn't even know that you call anything anger, although he may manifest it. He doesn't know that you call anything hot temper, although he may show it. He doesn't know that you, you call anything retaliation, although he might try to retaliate if you delay that natural milk. And yet, when eventually a person comes to the age of accountability, he makes the choice by himself. And he decides to go the wrong way. He decides to do the wrong thing. In Psalm 52, Reading from verse 1. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs. Like a sharp razor, walking deceitfully, thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than speaking righteousness. Here you are talking about a man that knows goodness but then he chooses evil he knows that it is wrong to walk deceitfully and yet he does it he does it deliberately and he does it by choice in psalm 53 verses 2 and 3 god looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. This is talking about action. Doing something. This is not talking about the nature. The nature of sin is there. We brought that into the world. The natural tendency to evil is there. We brought that into the world. But this is talking of the action of sin. And the, act and the things that a person will do. It says over here that everyone is gone back. All together become unfilthy. Become filthy rather. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, reading from verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. This is by choice. We have turned everyone to his own way. This is our practice. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Talking about the atonement of Jesus Christ. So then you see, there are outward sins. That needs forgiveness at salvation. On the other hand, there is inward, inbred sin. That needs to be destroyed and removed. 
at sanctification. Double cure for sin. Salvation, forgiveness, pardon for outward sins. Sanctification. Purifying or circumcision of the heart for the inbred sin or the nature of sin. We'll consider the message in a natural way. Number one, first cure from outward sins. Number two, second cure from inward sin. Number three, the blood that saves and sanctifies. Number one, first cure from outward sins. Here is where many of us in our church here have been confused because we mixed up salvation with sanctification and we're not very very clear as to when we say sin still remains in the nature of a person that is born again what does that exactly mean does that mean that the outward sins outward actions that are evil does that mean that all those outward things that are wrong are still in this person's life after he has been born again no when you come to the lord and you are born again there is the first cure from outward sins if these external outward sins are still there you cannot profess to have the first cure you cannot profess to have been forgiven you cannot profess to have got the grace of God. Let's see some of these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, now it gives us a list. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. No effeminate, no abusers of themselves with mankind, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now you understand all these things that you have seen here, they are things that can be recognized and seen outwardly, externally. Fornication, idol worship, adultery. Being effeminate, a man looking like a woman, abusers of themselves with mankind. These are things that are practiced in a very simple way to derive simple pleasure. And it's done externally. Thieves, when somebody steals, or being covetous, or when somebody becomes a drunkard, or he reviles other people. And it says extortioners also. These are external sins. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. From verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Notice again, these are things you can see on the outside. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Uncleanness, you know, that interprets a lot of things. A person that will look at the nude picture of men or women to defile himself or herself. A person that will deal with a literature that will stir up wrong emotion, wrong feeling in your body. A person that will go to a kind of nightclub and then in the dancing and all the various things that they do there will defile himself. And then talks of lasciviousness, idolatry, idol worship. And witchcraft, hatred, variance, simulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and then he says, and such like. That means, and so on. That means the list has not ended, and things like these. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which commit such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and all mongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars 
shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The point is this. These sins that ought to be dealt with at the time of salvation are outward sins. And when you are saved, all these outward sins are cleared up from your life. They are forgiven. They are taken away from your life. And you are free from them. Because salvation brings the grace of God into your life and makes you to have authority and power over all these outward sins. Let me, as we have read all those references, let me point to you some of these outward sins. If these outward sins are in anyone's life, it is either he has never met the Lord or he met the Lord before, but he has gone back to his vomit. In which case, something fresh needs to be done. It's like if you have taken birth for a child. And this child, you are getting the child ready to go to school. And you cleaned up the child. And you even toweled and you did everything. And you said, go and dress up. And instead of the child going to dress up, he went to play in the mud. And as he was, as he played in the mud, enjoying himself, you come out and say, what's the matter? I thought I took bath for you now. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to still put clean dress upon the dirty body, claiming that after all, I washed the child before? No, you don't do that. You take the child back again, and you want to wash the child again. So all these outward sins that should have been taken care of at salvation, if you now find them in your life, you can't say, but I know I was saved. But I know I was born again. But I know I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But I know I was cleansed. The point is, whatever you experienced in the past, if these outward sins are still discovered in your life, then go back and wash again. Go back and be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. What are these outward sins? I've read some passages to you. I'm just going to summarize for you now to understand uncleanness you're fumbling with your body so that you can derive simple simple pleasure you are dirty again fornication relationship between man and woman you have not got married it may be you are in courtship but you have not married it may be you are proposing but you have not married it may be that you have you know spoken to one another you've even spoken to the church but you have not married it may be you have done introduction but you have not married fornication or it may even be that this is your own genius sister living with you at home or this may be a cousin that is living with you and you are doing this evil thing fornication it is a sin and it means that even though maybe you say you are washed before you are now dirty you have to go back to the fountain open for uncleanness and for unrighteousness another thing adultery you leave your husband and then you go to another man that is not your husband. Or you leave your wife, you go to another woman that is not your wife. And you have sinful pleasure. Sinful pleasure at any level. Because there are people that will say, actually, we didn't do the real thing. I don't know the real thing. If you have done evil and you have got so near as to inflame your body, as to defile yourself, as to go near doing evil, even if you say you have not done what you call the real thing, you are an adulterer. And then it says murder. These are outward sins that should not be found in the life of a person that is a child of God in connection with murder abortion. In connection with murder suicide. A person that takes his own life has committed an outward sin and he that does such a sin has taken life, he cannot get to the kingdom of God. Prostitution. You sell your body for money. Either temporarily, there could be a one-day prostitution, a one-week prostitution, one-year prostitution. There could be a partial kind of profession that is prostitution. After all, there are people who are partial traders. They work in the office, but partially they also trade. And they will say, well, really I'm not a trader. Yes, we understand, but you trade a little. And you are a trader, partially. There may be people who will say, well, I'm not a prostitute because I'm not in that business. I, I do my job. But then, but you know that you get promotion by giving your body. But you know that you extort money from men by giving your body. But you know that you make unlawful gain by giving your body. 
But you know, you get contract by giving your body. Although you may not be a full-time prostitute, at least you are a partial one. Prostitution. Lying. And cursing. Do you know that there are people that do not know that cursing is one of these outward sins? Calling their children by abusive name. They'll call their children dog. What if God answered what you said and turned your child to dog? Then you begin to pray and pass and say, look at what happened to my child. That's what you call your child. We don't use abusive language. We don't use a kind of language to curse people. Abusive language is a sin. And when you get saved, all those things are cleared out of the way. Of course, blasphemy. Blasphemy is, uh, you know, blaspheming the name of God, using the name of God in vain, using the name of Jesus Christ in vain, or swearing, calling the name of God to a lie. You know you are selling something, and you know you are telling a lie about it. This is what I bought it. Then you call the name of God to witness your lie. It is the outward sin that you should have been free away from when you became a Christian. Slander. There are people that will slander other people, cut down other people, and defame other people, and say wrong things about other people. I'm sure you know that they need to be washed. They need to be born again. Backbiting. Backbiting. You know, sometimes a person goes to the farm, and there he is, just cutting the grass and cutting this and cutting this, not knowing that there is a serpent coming from behind. And then that serpent bites from the back. And it just feels a sharp pain. He turns around, and the serpent is already going away, but he knows that poison has entered. There are people that have the nature of the serpent. And they will bite you at the back. In front of you, they will smile. They will laugh. They will say, praise the Lord. They will say, you are my brother. They will say, I appreciate you. Oh, they say, we pray for you in our family every day. Never mind. At your back, they bite. And that backbiting is one of the outward sins that we should have been free from when we became Christians. Tail bearing is related to the backbiting. Tell bearing is carrying story, bad story from days to days. Did you hear? Where have you gone? You didn't hear? You didn't know so and so and such and such? How they are carrying on? Uh, you didn't hear that so and so has parked out of um, uh, husband's house uh, and you are in this city? You didn't hear that they terminated such and such uh, so and so's appointment? You didn't hear that sister so-and-so had miscarriage. <clears throat> we don't know what they're doing in their life. We don't know their secret sin. We don't know all these people. Who knows where they're going? Who knows even whether they, are, whether they have this or they have that? Miscarriage. And didn't you know? Watch her when we get to church. Don't say I told you, but just watch her. Ah, it's a lie. She may wear maternity guys. say lie. That thing has gone. Tell me any. Going from days to days to days. Are they born again? The Bible says no. Are they still retaining their experiences? The Christian experience? The Bible says no. What are they looking for? Is it sanctification they are looking for? The Bible says no. That if these outward sins are in their lives, that they do not even profess, they shouldn't profess to be saved. How about stealing? How about borrowing and not paying back again? That's what the Bible says. The Bible says the wicked borrow it and does not pay back again you find a person that will say uh, can i have a five naira there can i have ten naira there can i have one thousand naira there can i have twenty thousand naira there can i have fifty thousand naira there and they never think of paying back the bible says they are sinners and the bible says that such people that borrow money and they do not even plan they do not even think of paying back that they have this outward sin in their lives the wicked borrow it and pay it not back again gambling and the love of money. When a person is gambling and is playing lottery, now what is it? You find in the pocket of a, in the pocket of a Christian, you dip your hand in his pocket, and then something took your hand. You say, "Ah, what is this?" <laughs> Believer, you carry the the uh, top of a bottle all about Pepsi Pepsi Crown. What are you looking for? Ah, they said that if we, once we get the number up to this, and get the number up to this, and get the number up to this, that we're going to win something. You want to reap where you have not sold? You want to gamble? You want to do lottery? You want to be competing with the people so that I can win this, I can win this, sister so-and-so, one motorcycle, where is she going to ride it? 
Sister so and so won this and won that. We Christians, we don't gamble with the people of the world. It is the love of money. And the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they pierced themselves with many sorrows, and they drowned themselves in hopeful loss and perdition. And you, O man of God, flee this is. You run away from them. So love of money is one of these outward things, outward things that need to be cleansed and taken away when you are born again. Covetousness. And then idolatry, idol worship, and sorcery, and witchcraft. Of course, hypocrisy. How about hatred? How about malice? You know that there are people that may say they are in the choir, but the malice, I'm telling you, the malice is at its height. If that sister sees this other sister in the choir, it says, I don't know how I feel. I don't think I can stay in the choir. I don't think I can be there because since sister so-and-so is there, since brother so-and-so is there, I suspect them that they have familiar spirit. And once sister so-and-so is there, I cannot be there. You are not born again. Because if you are born again, there will be no suspicion. And there will be no malice. And you know, there are, there are different kinds of malice. There is the outright, aggressive, definite, known, manifest malice that you know so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, they are keeping malice together. There's another kind of malice. It is called diplomatic malice. Very diplomatic. And, you know, when you are coming this way, if the man, if the woman can avoid, you know, see you face to face, he goes the other way. I never want to talk to that man. And I hope we don't meet. And I hope he doesn't have to talk to me. And then when you are coming, they look in another direction. And they do that deliberately and permanently, regularly, because of diplomatic malice. And eventually when they cannot get out of it, and you know, you come face to face to them. And then you say something, he's going to answer in a very diplomatic way. In fact, he begins to pray internally. Oh God, help me. Don't let me open up too much. Don't let me be friendly. Don't let me give myself into the hands of a deceiver. Because I know, he's praying internally, all that you are saying, and you ask him, you think he's hearing you, he's not hearing you. He's praying internally. Help me to control myself, because I shouldn't talk to this person. He's a child of the devil. I'm a child of God, and I mustn't talk to a person like this. And when you finish all your question, you say, uh, what's the answer you are going to give me? He didn't hear you all the time. Internally, he was praying. Internally, he was talking. Don't let me get muddled up with this fellow malice. Doesn't want to talk to a fellow brother, a fellow sister. How can we say we are saved? We are children of God. And we cannot greet people. We cannot relate normally with people. And of course, you know, these people that keep the kind of malice, they talk and talk and talk against the people they are keeping malice with. And a child of God cannot do that. If we're doing that, it simply means we're not children of God. And then quarreling. 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 You see, there are, there are people that waste a lot of time. And a lot of time they waste is that, you know, we say, ah, Brother Coordinator, what have you been doing? Oh, he says, I'm very, very busy. Very, very busy in our district. Because, you know, uh, some of our sisters, although they are wonderful, talented sisters, but they quarrel too much. And sometimes I need to sit down. And I sit down with them for two hours. And this one, in fact, while I'm sitting down with them and trying to talk to them, this sister A will abuse sister B. And sister B will say, it's me you abuse like that, even though coordinator is there, bam, and slap her. And I begin, to, I say, ah, I'm coordinator, I am here, I am here, don't fight, don't fight, don't fight. Primary school settling. And you think, oh, those sisters in my district, I don't know what to do with them. They are wonderful sisters. In fact, they are workers. But they quarrel. They are not children of God. Children of God don't fight. Do children of God fight? Tell me out loud. Uh -huh, but some of you that are answering me now, some of you are fighting. Some of you quarrel. And, we, and they have to be settling quarrel for you. And if and eventually when they say, okay, we will take you to pastor, we'll, eh, okay, settle it for us here. We don't want pastor to know, but God knows, but the angels know, but heaven knows that you are no more a child of God. Once fighting and quarreling has come in, anger, violence. You know, sometimes uh, a, a husband will just do something very simple like this, and the wife will be violent. Violent, you can't believe it. Violent, you can't believe it. Or sometimes it is the wife that uh, ordinary thing, maybe the food is late a little, or this and that, and the man can be violent. 
violent, violent, I'm saying violent. The man can break the cup and break the plate and take that a bowl of a rice and say, this is the rice you gave me and this is a kind of a soup you gave me. Am I a beggar? Am I a slave? Am I your boy boy? That you gave me this kind of thing. Bam on the ground. And eventually after about uh, you know 30 minutes when the husband, wife well, quickly went back to the kitchen and gave all the meat in the kitchen and brought everything. He was say, uh, hey. That that time it was Satan. It was Satan. If you are violent like that, that means you are a sinner. You cannot because of food. Because of meat or no meat. It means that you really have not been cleansed from your outward sin. Or it is cruelty. And you know people who are cruel. You know people who are cruel. You know sometimes, uh, uh, some of the times, I now counsel little children. They bring a child to me. And they would say that, you know, this child, want pastor to pray for the child. I say, what's the problem? Ah, they would say the child, uh, you know, just runs out of there, does not like to sleep in the house. Then I said, I will not pray for us, but how do you treat the child? Uh, when he comes back like that, this is what we do. And all I can say is that they are cruel to the child. And the child is wondering, can this one be my daddy? Can this one be my mommy? Or did, just, did, did, just, did they just bring me to this family? And because of that cruelty, the child cannot stay in that home. And if you are cruel like that, and you say, well, I'm training the child. You are training the child. There are a lot of marks on the body of the child already. And the child is saying, when I grow up, I will not go to this church with them. When I grow up, I will never stay in this place like this. When I grow up, in fact, I say, girl, if you treat that girl, that girl is going to say, I'm going to find a boy to marry in time and run out of this place. This place is too hot because of cruelty. And if we say we're children of God, all that ought to go away. Rebellion. Injustice. Retaliation. Do you know there are people like in this church, even though they say their work as retaliation, revenge. You threw a block at me, I'm going to throw cement at you. And then divorce. Drunkenness. Gluttony. You see, there are some Christians that will say, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. They don't know when their stomach is full. They will eat and eat and eat like this until their belly is inconveniencing them. If you say, it remains a little gary, can you take it, give me, I will try. And even after they have taken that and they have drunk all the, maybe they drink Pepsi, they drink whatever they want to drink, and uh, you say, well, what are we going to do with this one now? Do we keep it or do we throw it away? And he says, uh, where is it? And then he says, what is that? Well, you have taken already Gary and you have taken the other things and you cannot take beans at the same time. Everything is going to the same belly. Give it to me. Gluttony. If you are a glutton, how do you say you are a Christian? You cannot control what you take in. You cannot control how you eat. Drunkenness and gluttony are relatives. They are similar. Bribery. Fraud. Dishonesty. Simple pleasure. Dancing. You see, there are people that will go to all these uh, nightclubs, or maybe you don't go to nightclub, and you have all this music in your house, and then you lock your door, and you are dancing to it. And when people open the door, when people want to come in, you stop that music, and then you say, oh, welcome to the sanctuary. Then you bring out the Deeper Life magazine, and you bring out the Bible, and you're not a hypocrite. And in decent dressing, scorning, mockery, murmuring, False witness, evil speaking, I service, partiality, the unequal yoke, eating things sacrificed to idols, pride, envy, jealousy, sowing discord among the brethren. You see, all these things are pointed out to you. These are outward sins. And these outward sins, the Bible says, they should not be once named or mentioned among those of us who say that we are the children of God. They should have repented of them. They should have called upon the name of the Lord. They should have been forgiven and taken away from your life in Romans chapter 28. Romans chapter 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You see, covering up will not give you mercy. 
covering up will not make you to discover the grace of God. Saying, well, it wasn't my fault. I know I'm cruel, but it wasn't my fault. I retaliated, but it wasn't my fault. I know that I, I was, uh, you know, whispering and backbiting, tail bearing against those people, but it's not my fault. Giving excuse and covering up will not give you forgiveness and cleansing and a change of life. It is when you confess and you forsake. And you say, violence is not good for a child of God. Fraud is not good for a child of God. Backbiting is not proper for a child of God. Going about and cursing people cursing people, insulting people. That's not the language of a child of God. And I should not try to make any excuse for any outward sin like this. If salvation is there, sin is out. If sin is there, salvation is absent. It says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them. Confessing and forsaking them. It is not only that you confess, you also forsake. You do away with them. You turn away from them. And you promise the Lord by the grace of God, you will not go back into your vomit again. Hosea chapter 14. Verse 2. If a person wants forgiveness, he wants the first cure for the sins, outward sins of his life. How does he do it? Verse 2. Hosea chapter 14. Take with you words. And turn to the Lord and say unto him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so we will render the calves of our leaves. It says when you come to the Lord and you want him to forgive you, you want him to save you, you want him to cure you from all these outward sins, it says you will say, oh God, take away all iniquity that none will remain. Take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously. That means you are telling God, I don't merit forgiveness. I don't merit the salvation of God. I don't merit the peace of God. This is not by merit. This is only by your grace. That's what you tell the Lord. And after you have been saved, after your sins have been forgiven, what are you going to do? Are you going to continue in those things? No, not at all. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, reading from verse 4. Whoso committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. If you say you have been born again, if you are keeping that salvation, all these things that we have talked about, all these outward sins, they will not be in your life. If they are there, you've gone back to your vomit. You've gone back to the mire. You've gone back into the dead. You've gone back into your corruption and pollution. It means you need to be washed again. In verse 5, ye know. Don't you know if you have experienced it? Ye know. Don't you know if you know really the reality of Calvary? If you know what Christ has done on the cross, I'm sure you know. You know that he was manifested to take away our sins. He doesn't save us in our sins. He saves us from our sins. Takes you away from your sin. So that the sin will not be there again. And verse 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Then it says, Whosoever sinneth. Whosoever sinneth. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. To experience genuine salvation, all known sins should be confessed and forsaken. And then there will be sincere desire to be free from the outward sins and to be separate and different from the sinners. Point two. Second cure for inward sin. Second cure for inward sin. Here is where you now need to pay attention very closely. Because this is where many people are confused. And they do not know what is referred to as inward sin. Let me give you some illustrations. These are just illustrations. In Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. Verse 9. The thought of foolishness is sin. And his corner is an abomination to men. Look at the first part. The thought of foolishness is sin. 
somebody has a thought. He broods over that thought. He meditates on that thought. And he runs that thought over and over and over in his mind. He doesn't go out to steal. He doesn't go out to commit fornication. He's not even visibly angry. He's not cruel. He's not violent. He doesn't take what belongs to other people. He doesn't open his mouth to bear false witness. But there is this thought of foolishness within him or within her. It may be the thought that maybe I should go into the world. But he has not gone to the world. Maybe I should do this. Why this? Why this? Why that? Only the thought in the heart. And this person is brooding over that thought, meditating over that thought. And the sin is so very strong within. Although he has not gone out to do it, therefore we cannot label him to be a sinner with outward manifestation. We cannot say, look at the outward sin in your life. We cannot even see. It's just a thought that he covers up. But he's battling, battling seriously with that thought. The thought of foolishness is sin. You see, that needs to be dealt with. Let me give you more illustrations for you to understand. A person can be free from outward sin, and yet there's something that is going on on the inside. It's in 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. From verse 1, and it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite at a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, and near very close by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near to my house. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. Now look at this situation. Can you say this person has committed any sin? He didn't steal the vineyard. He didn't at this time oppress neighbor to take the vineyard away from him. He didn't at this time just said, just make a fence around the vineyard and put it somewhere and say, it is mine. He didn't do that. He looked at it, he wanted it. So far, so good. Then he went to Naboth himself. So far, so good. He said, give me this vineyard. And he even said the purpose he was going to use the vineyard for. So far, so good. Then he said, do you know I have a better vineyard than another place? Only that is far away. I will give it to you. Let us make an exchange. He wasn't stealing it at this time. So far, so good. And then it says, or oh, if you don't want an exchange, you tell me the price, and I will give them the worth of it in money. What can you say he has done wrong? What can you say that he has done that you call an outward sin? And then verse 3, And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me, that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. So far, so good. Naboth said, You know this? This is the inheritance of my fathers. And I don't want to part with it. When I see it, it reminds me that this was, uh, you know, for my family. And I inherited it from my family. Now look at what happened. And Ahab came into his house heavy. He didn't abuse Neha- uh, Naboth. Therefore, there was no, none at this time, no outward manifestation of sin in his action. But internally, look at the inside. He came to his house heavy, displeased, because of the word which Nabal the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed, and he turned away his face, and would not, and will eat no bread. Now you know there is something inside. No stealing outwardly. No fighting outwardly. No going to court outwardly. Yet you can see there was something inside. It is that thing that is inside which says sanctification needs to deal with. He was so displeased. He was so unhappy. Because that thing did not belong to him. 
And although he did not steal, he went to his house, he couldn't even eat. And then he lay on the bed and he faced the other side. You could tell there was something inside that needed to be dealt with. That's what we're saying. That even though you are free from outward sin, and all these outward branches that people can see, we cannot see them again. But internally, there's something to be dealt with. Inwardly, there is something to be dealt with. Look at another illustration. In 2 Samuel, chapter 13. Now, in the case of Ahab and Naboth, when the wife saw what happened and said, Why are you like this? Then Ahab told Jezebel the story. Then it was planned and eventually outward sin manifested. And then they killed Naboth and possessed the vineyard. That's the outward part of it. But the point is, there was something inwardly. Inwardly. Let's look at 2 Samuel from chapter 13. Verse 1. And it came to pass after this, that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister, whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard to, for him to do anything to her. And Amnon had a friend, whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said unto him, Why art thou? Being the king's son, lean from day to day, will thou not tell me? And I'm not said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother's, my brother Absalom's sister. Now you see what has happened here. This man, as far as verse 4, which I've read to you, had not touched the woman, had not committed fornication, had not done incest, or committed immorality with a relative, and yet there was something on the inside. And this thing on the inside was so intense and so terrible that the young man was getting lean because of what he had in the heart. Looking at him, what has he done? Did he speak dirty word? No. Did he speak dirty joke? No. Did he approach that lady to rough handle her? No, not at all. Did he even touch that lady? Not at all. But there was something on the inside. That's the point. It may be that outwardly you are all right. Outwardly, all these things that we talk about as stealing, as fraud, as changing account and changing receipt and tapping this and tapping that and picking this and pilfering here and there, all that is gone. The drunkenness, the gambling, the dancing, the pornography, all that is gone. But internally, there is something there. Internally, there is a root of sin. Internally, there is this evil sin that needs to be dealt with. Well, in, the, in this case again, so far so good. But later, it happened that when Jonadab instructed Amnon as to what to do, it eventually came out in the outward scene. But you know that it was internal force, and in that internal situation, when nothing had been done, you would have said that, well, the man has not done anything outwardly. But internally, there was a problem. In Second Chronicles chapter 25, Second Chronicles chapter 25, from verses 1 to 2, Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jonah Je Jehoadan of Jerusalem. Listen to verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. You see that? That's salvation. A person is saved, and then he doesn't do anything wrong. He reads his Bible. He has his quiet time. He even joins the choir. He joins the ushers. He reads, he studies the scripture. He witnesses, he does everything. Doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But there is a but there. There is a comma there. There is an imperfection there. There is something that needs the attention of God. And the kill, the double kill, the second kill. It says, but not with a perfect heart. And that is why we need sanctification. That even though you can see that this individual may appear righteous. And is not doing anything outwardly wrong. In fact, he does everything correctly. That you are likely to say, I can't see where to condemn the man. 
Only if you have the Spirit of God, you will know that He does everything outwardly right. He does everything outwardly correct. But the attitude, the heart, the disposition, the thoughts within, the desires within, the ambition within, the way it is actually done, it fulfills the letter of the word. But the Spirit of the word is missing. He did that which was right in the sight of God, but not with a perfect heart. And that's what God wants to do for us. He wants us to have that perfect heart. He wants to circumcise our heart. He wants to cleanse us on the inside. He wants to take away that root of sin, that body of sin. He wants to destroy it and deal a deadly blow to it. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and all thy soul that thou mayest live. Here you see the real sanctification that you see outward sins are gone when you are born again, when you are saved. And those outward sins don't come back as long as you remain saved. You don't steal as long as you remain saved. You don't tell lies as long as you remain saved. You will not commit adultery or fornication as long as you remain saved. But even though those outward sins are no more there because you are saved, there's something on the inside that needs to be dealt with. That's why Jesus prayed for the sanctification of his disciples. John chapter 17. John chapter 17 from verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 20, neither pray for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. Stop there for a moment. When you are really sanctified, you are completely one. And let me tell you, it's not a kind of the outward unity that we think we have. You see, there are times that you, are, you say you are one with the church and you are one with the doctrines of the Bible, but internally, internally, you may, you may so control yourself that you never speak anything about this unity. You may so put yourself under, you know, temperance and you, are, you don't allow yourself to openly come in a very disagreeable manner and everybody looks at you as if you are in agreement with everything that is going on. But actually, internally, you are not as united as you appear to be because there is a lack of sanctification. When you are sanctified, there will be this unity and oneness from within. That there's no pretense, there's no cover up. You are united outwardly, you are united within you. It says that they may all be one, as thou Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. One in us. That is, God can look into that unity and oneness, and God says, it is right, it is perfect, it is the kind of oneness that he wants. When you are sanctified. And then in First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. From verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And God in him. When we are born again. That's the kind of love we have. Beautiful, wonderful love. But it's limited. Very, very limited. We're born again. We're children of God. We're so, up. we're so grateful that God brought us to a church like this. And we're so grateful that we even have opportunity of being able to minister, being a worker in a church like this. We're grateful to God. And we have love. Love for the brethren. But the love is much, much limited. And you see the limit of the love when there is a problem. You see the limit of the love when there's misunderstanding. You see the limit of the love when things are delayed. I think I should have been an area leader by now, but it's still delayed. You see the limit of your love. You see the limit of the love when you should have been a zonal leader, coordinator by now, but you are not. You see the limit of the love when some opportunities are denied you. When you are born again, you love one another. You love the brethren. You forgive the people that offend you. But then there is a kind of offense they are going to have towards you that you will see the limitation of the love you have as a born-again child of God. Then in verse 17, herein is a love made perfect. When you are sanctified. That your love is made perfect. 
that no matter, come what me, I want to remind you of Joseph, that these were his own brothers that sold him into slavery. And if you remember the story, how many nights he must have wept, how many nights he must have remembered, I'm caught away from my father, I'm caught away from my family. And I, when he went to the prison, and when Potiphar's wife told a lie against him, and that young man never opened his mouth to say, it's a lie, it's a lie. And everybody believed that this Joseph was a foolish fellow, a dirty fellow wanting to commit sin with the wife of his master. And it was not so at all. It was not so at all. With all the lie that was told against him. And in the prison, here, here he was in the prison. And when he even became a leader over those people in the prison, he never said anything wrong again, Potiphar's wife or against Potiphar himself, and eventually they took him out of that prison and interpreted dream. And when he interpreted the dream, then they said, okay, you will not be next to Pharaoh the king. Now if you were, remember this is Old Testament. If you were, remember there was no counseling. If you were, remember there was no deeper life Bible church. If you were, remember there was no case search. If you were, remember, there was no other person to be having workers retreat like this with him and preaching to him and preaching to him, telling him, don't retaliate, don't revenge, you are, you are a child of God, and make sure that you don't lose. There's nobody to encourage him. If you were, what would you have done in such a situation? He didn't say, call Potiphar to see me, and call his wife to see me. And say, you see now, who is higher now? Myself or yourself? And you, woman, you told lie against me. Now I am next to the king. You and your husband, you will pay for it. I'm not, I'm not being wicked. It is not wickedness. I will teach you lessons so you will not do it to other people. But Joseph did not do that. And then his brothers came. And he recognized his brothers. What would you have done? He gave them bags of foodstuffs and put the money back there. But he did something. He delayed one of them so that he wanted them to come back. And eventually they came back. And when they came back, he told all the Egyptians to go away. And he said, I am your brother. I'm not your enemy. I am your brother, Joseph. Is my father still alive? They couldn't talk. Because they didn't know what he would do. Oh, he said, come nearer. Don't think of what you have done. It is God that sent me here before you to preserve a posterity for Jacob and for Israel. You see that law? When we are born again, we have a limited kind of love. But when you are sanctified, when the Adamic nature is removed, when the root of sin is eradicated out of you, when the tendency to sin, and when that very body of sin is taken away, it says, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in law. There's no hypocrisy in law. There's no eye service in law. There's no fear in law. You are doing something now, and then the pastor is coming, then you change and you don't do that thing again. Why? Why are you doing like that? There's no fear in law. There's no pretense or eye service. It says, there is no fear in law, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You see, that is the reason we need sanctification. How do we get sanctified? When we know that we need it. And we go to God asking him. And we pray and we believe. Then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I have an amen there? At sanctification, the inbred sin, the inward sin, the old man, the stony heart, the uncircumcised heart is dealt with. This second application of the blood of Jesus destroys the old man, thereby taking out the nature of sin. It cleanses us from inward sin. And makes us holy within. The lost image of God is restored. Perfect communion is established with God. A deeper surrender of life to God is made possible. And a closer walk with God is assured. 
Sanctification is a deeper work of grace in those already saved. Very briefly, the last point, the blood that saves and sanctifies. On the one hand, the blood of Jesus saves. Then, on the other hand, the blood of Jesus sanctifies. Just to reference this because of our time. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Let's read from verse 18. Inasmuch as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us and saves us and takes away from us all those outward sins that I described to you earlier. And after your sins have been taken away, after you have been forgiven, then there's a possibility of going for a second application of the blood of Jesus Christ to sanctify you. There are many references we could refer to, but time is gone. In Hebrews now chapter 13, referring to the blood of Jesus that sanctifies. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Jesus, that he might sanctify, purify, make holy. He suffered without the gate, he shed his blood. Verses 20 and 21, that same chapter. Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work, to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. The blood of Jesus Christ is still available today. If you need to be saved, free from all those outward sins, it is possible tonight. If you want to be sanctified, and you want him to deal with the inward sin, inward nature of sin, the inward depravity, it is possible today because the blood of Jesus Christ has not lost its power. And it will not lose its power when it comes to your turn. It will save you if you need to be saved. It will restore you if you need to be restored. It will cleanse you and forgive you if you need to be cleansed and forgiven. It will sanctify you if you need to be sanctified. Why don't you rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer? You need to be sanctified? Talk to the Lord. Or have you discovered outward sins? I read a lot of those things to you so that you will not be in darkness. Have you discovered outward sins? And you know that you've gone back into the mire. You've gone back into the dirt. Now you understand the difference between salvation and sanctification. Which one have you got? Now you understand the difference between outward sin and inward sin. Which one have you got? Have you got outward sins? Then you are not saved. Are you free from outward sins? But the, in the inner man, in the inner nature, in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind, you can still discover those sins that are there. Then you need to be sanctified. Within, within, that the Lord will circumcise your heart and cleanse your heart and wash you on the inside with the blood of Jesus Christ, with the sanctifying blood of Jesus. If there is outward sin, don't deceive yourself. Salvation is not there. You are stealing, salvation is not there. You are smoking in secret, salvation is not there. You are telling lies, salvation is not there. You have the love of money driving you about, salvation is not there. Fornication is there, adultery is there, salvation is not there. Gambling is there, dancing to all this worldly music is there, salvation is not there. Don't deceive yourself. If you are fraudulent and you are changing receipts and you are bribing your way through to get contracts, salvation is not there. When we say we are saved, outward sins are taken away. When you are forgiven, all those outward sins will no more be there. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that will you also read. Are you a gambler? 
Are you the one that has borrowed and does not intend to pay back? Are you unclean? Are you committing abortion? If those outward sins are there, you are not a citizen in the kingdom of God. He that doeth these sins is worthy of death. Not only do the same, but having pleasure in them that do them. 